I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. Well, why don't we start with a little bit of your background and how yeah, yeah. did you end up in such a niche kind of role? Yeah. So well, where, where did you start with sport, with crime or with corruption? It, it, it's funny, um, as, a, as a kid, I wanted to be a sports reporter and I kind of grew, grew up a little bit and uh, <laughs> thought there were kind of serious things in the world as well. And I kind of, my careers in the beginning was, um, I'd bounced from news and sport and news and sport. So it kind of crystallised into why not do sports news or or sport as news, if you want. Yeah. Um, and I, I was quite lucky as well, um, in a sense. I um, in two thousand and five, I think it was. Uh, I was working at the Manchester Evening News in in the traditional path, local newspapers with yeah. the hope of being a, a, a British national paper. Um, and but my interest were, was always um, kind of international. I like languages and. and mm foreign news and whatever um and I happened to break my leg playing football so I was off work and was just on on it was a it was the Guardian jobs website of all things right and um there was a a vacancy for the Associated Press which is the the American um news agency Mm. um and it had a a job for a, a correspondent in in the UK um, and I thought, hang on, if I can get into there, they've got a international outlook. It will be Britain as a f- kind of foreign place as well. Yeah. And I might be able to get some of that travel or at least maybe do get sent somewhere or, or eventually. Um, I didn't hold much hope, but they had, a, they had quite a young bureau chief at the time, um, a lady called Paisley Dodds, uh, who I've lost touch with. And... I think she took a massive risk and I was quite inexperienced at the time. And I joined the AP right. uh, uh, as a news correspondent, really. Um, I'd started, funny enough, in 2019, in, in not in the UK, but in, in, in Paris, uh, working for Eurosport, doing sport. So I was like, OK, so I'm going to be doing news now. Um, I did two or three years with the Associated Press, and that ended, I was sent to Pakistan briefly when Benazir Bhutto, uh, the former Prime Minister, returned, Um, and it was, um, you know, quite a a shocking end for her. She she was killed um, at the end of that return. She went back, you know, uh, hoping for a glorious return and being re-elected and didn't end up that way. I came back to the UK with the view that they would send me back there. And that kind of was was stuck. I was a little bit frustrated. I was back here in, in, in London. Um, and this company, I must say I hadn't heard of, um, Bloomberg. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, had a uh, had a um, interesting um, vacancy for a sports journalist and they were um, a financial news company and they Obviously, I know a lot about them now, having spent nine years there subsequently. <laughs> um, uh, I, I joined them and they, I was like, hang on, there, there is a really interesting thing here. This is a company that is devoted to financial news, but they've got this sports section. Um, and we did some of the regular sport, if you, if you want, but there was you know it's a it's there's a lot of money in sport and no one really or a few were people were really covering it yeah i thought why don't we just use that brand and and just sort of try and nail nail down um the, 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 the money the, the, the business, business of sport. sport really yeah 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 exactly so um i had some really good colleagues there as well brilliant colleagues um i think alex duff i ended up writing a book with he was based in madrid um and we, we um, Danielle Rossing from the Netherlands, as well, a really good tennis reporter, and we kind of did some interesting work. And they had, and this is the, you know, Nicola, you know this as well. Um, that the, a lot of the problems with journalism is that there isn't enough money to do the reporting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's quite tough. Newsrooms budgets are quite tight. 
uh, but this one wasn't, um, and they they had they had a budget to do reporting, and and that meant we were able to travel a bit, start covering um, sport, money in sport and sport internationally, uh, sport politics brings us into the orbit of FIFA, the football governing body, um, UEFA, European football's governing body, the IOC, um, and then you kind of get to see the architecture of of global sport as it collides with all this money and and and, and politics and, th and that's what i did um there uh for for nine years and that 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 business of sport started to roll into i guess corruption because where there is money and power you are likely to find um corruption and it was kind of learning through experience as well building building that contact space up and sort of seeing that increasingly grubby underbelly of sport you know there's still the people the holdovers from when it was amateur trying to keep it behind closed doors and getting mm. wealthy and then, and then big money coming in as well um and then in in 2017 i left to to essentially do some of the same work maybe a bit broader as well with the, with the new york times where i am now and that involves more um kind of social issues as well still the money still the politics still the corruption but but issues that are related to you know worker rights in in qatar for example um doping or sexual abuse um unfortunately stories like that but um yeah someone says you know if if, if and it's a bit grim most of the stories that i'm going to be involved with most of them not all of them thankfully aren't going to be very positive no it's like myself with the yes. crime. I think it's it's sort of maybe a place where everything collides, doesn't it? You talk about politics and economics and everything. Celebrity, of course, as yeah, well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and sports seems to be a bit like that. So, wh where had you had you written your book, Football Secret Trade, at that point when you started working for the New York Times? Yes, yes. Just um, it was a labor passion project, really, for Alex and I. We didn't really make <laughs> any any money from it, but that that's an interesting story in itself. Um, we, um, as we were looking at various aspects of this was the football industry and the thing that makes fans, I think, unfortunately, um, more excited than anything else is the kind of rumour mill and the trading of these human beings, these football players uh, from one team to the other, um, perhaps even more so than what's actually happening on the field, because there's an element of fantasy to it. You know, if we just get this player, we could win this game or we could win this cup. And um, so around the summertime, uh, which is now the off season, uh, you get thousands and thousands of words every day on, on who might be going to which country or which team for how many million euros, dollars, yen, whatever. Mm. Um, and in that, this is a global trading market, which is still very opaque. And it creates opportunity for people to move vast amounts of money around. And Nicola, you know, the sort of people who might want to do mm, that. Mm. Um, uh, so we, we were looking into this and we stumbled upon, and it's now very well known, this practice of, it was known in, in the trade as third party ownership, where essentially investors, um, sometimes under the cloak of um, trust, a blind trust, um, anonymous companies, mm. very rarely you know who's behind a lot of these, would um, buy stakes in, in football players. So, for example, um, happened in Brazil, South America in the beginning. Brazil was like the home of this, um, where clubs were selling portions of uh, the players in their squads. So, you know, me me and you could set up a company and we, we'll knock on the door of, I don't know, Brazil's biggest club, Flamengo, and we say, look, we, we want to give you half a million dollars for 25% of the rights to your centre forward or 50% of the rights to your centre forward. And, and when you sell him, mm -hmm. we will get that percentage um, of that total quantum, of the total amount he's sold for. And this was happening on an industrial scale um, and it got bigger and bigger, came to Europe and, and no one, no one was properly paying attention. I, you know, not to, 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 you know, not to give journalism to, you know, uh, yeah. I, I do think journalism has a massive role in, um, in, 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 in what, what action 
uh, authorities eventually take, because we kind of shine a light on some of this stuff. FIFA would eventually, the, the global governing body, ban the practice because mm -hmm. it, it became out of control. And Alex and I, who'd both lived in Brazil, that was the other part of my journey as well. While I was at Bloomberg, I, I'd lived in Brazil for um, about three and a half years. Alex had lived there before. So this kind of, we were able to tell this cross-border trans national story of, of, of cash transfers and, and, and I guess the transfer of human beings and investments and seeing human beings commodified in this way. Um, and that, that eventually was outlawed just before our, our book was published. And like, was that something, were you like as a sports fan and somebody who had probably dreamed as a young child of becoming a, a sports journalist and all that goes with sport, the thrill and everything, were you hugely disappointed or were you cynical old journalist at that stage already were you disappointed by football and by what went on behind the scenes it's a, it's a really good question I think um you know if you ask me now yeah absolutely I, I, it's very hard to have um much passion for the industry to be honest when you see um quite a lot of what we've seen you know on, on so many levels um whether it's you know this kind of player trading local level, you know, $7 billion, by the way, mm. uh, of international player transfers a year. It's quite a lot of money. <laughs> um, or or, or the, the people who we have entrusted to look after football. Um, you know, you had your own scandals in Ireland. Um, John Delaney, the former president there, yeah. thankfully no longer there. Um, but there's lots of John Delaney's all over um, football internationally. And you, and you see that. And the, it arouses so much passion. It's interest and, and people love this game but no one's really looking out for it um the way it's structured is it's it's a bit of a grab either for power or for money or for or, you know or for prestige mm. um, the, the right decisions aren't being taken for the right reasons um and you see a lot of that um when i'm yeah i mean when when this yeah i felt like this for, for years, I suppose. Once you, once you, once you look at it, um, but then you know there are there are good moments as well because sport does deliver that. And that's probably what attracts a lot of people. Is is that there's some really good stories, of 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 it's life changing stories for some of these athletes who have come from nothing, um, and you know are one that their own personal stories and also what they're showing us. You know some of the most. Um, the artistry, the, the 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 great skill, the drama of some of those um, some of the games. It doesn't even have to be the highest level. Mm. You know, it, recently there was a a team in England, Sheffield Wednesday. Um, they were in the playoffs, so from the third tier to the second tier, um, they have a black manager, um, and they lost the first game. Of this two-game semi-final, four four nil against um, Peterborough team in southern England or eastern England, sorry. Um, and the manager was racially abused online, and all sorts of awful um, commentary uh, about him. And then in that second game, it was like you know the idea was going to be impossible for them to turn this round, and they did. Yeah. <laughs> this incredible game, uh, um, this incredible turnaround. And, you know, you're biting your nails as though it was the World Cup final, just being caught up in the drama of it. And it was a great, great story. And that was just very recent. And there is so much of that as well. But does but everything is... does everything get forgiven by those thrilling moments in sport? And, you know, is that really what lies at the heart of it? For a moment. And, it, and it's that... It's what's tantalizing and keeps bringing everyone back as yeah. well. Doesn't it? Like yeah. you see a lot of ugly things, but you think, oh, hang on, um, this looks interesting. Yeah. And, and, and you're, you're back into the heart of, of this again. And nothing, I suppose, would typify that as well as the, in one way, a very grotesque month in, in Qatar, right? Mm -hmm. um, we had this World Cup, which is the world's most popular event, not necessarily a sporting event, just the thing that draws more eyeballs than anything else on our planet, yeah. um, taking place in this, you know, desert state, you know, size of Yorkshire in, 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 the, in the UK, 
um, that was built, you know, allegedly um, on corruption. I, I, I covered half my career, in fact, has been attached to this event. I was thinking that Qatar started bidding for the World Cup in 2009. Mm. I remember covering the bidding process. And then the the um, the 13 years that followed up until that glorious final game, you know, the best World Cup final on, you know, in terms of sport. But, you know, that that was built on um, essentially a bunch of old geezers, all old, old men uh, behind closed doors voting for the least suitable place candidate yeah. at the time to 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 host this this event they really couldn't give a damn about protecting the sport that 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 was their charge to mm -hmm. grow and protect football they were the most important 24 men in football only 22 of them actually voted because two of them already kicked out because they they had um been found to uh, you know, offered to sell their votes to undercover reporters <laughs> even before even before the vote took place. And then then we then we get into that journey of um, migrant labor abuse, um, the building of those you know citadels, white elephants in the Qatari desert, um, and and then this 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 project of projecting this country that let's be honest none of us had really heard of before 2009 um into a, a major international player i mean extraordinary and do you think qatar i was mentioning to you earlier that you were united arab emirates and maybe abu dhabi do those countries actually believe that they they're, they're just so into sport are they throwing their weight around as countries? Or are they actually sort of trying to use and wash corruptible funds? I mean, what what do you think that why are they so adamant that they want boxing, they want Formula One, mm. now golf out Saudi? We'll come back to that. But why do these countries want the sports? Is it to wash the money or is it as, you know, we're better than the rest of you? Not necessarily wash wash the money because the, the the money's legitimate in the sense, look, we all use, you know, in England, there is this, um, well, there was when I was a kid, an advert for the new national lottery. We didn't have a national lottery here. And and the ad, I remember very well, and I use that image quite a lot with with what they've done with their money and also how, how they have their money. Um, and, and the advert is a, a, it's a finger that is just, descending from 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 outside of the world like through the sky and it points to one house yeah. and it says it, it could be you that's the tagline mm. that 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 the finger of fate could point at you and what these countries have is an abundance of something that we all need and want to make you know, the modern world work which is these hydrocarbons in Qatar sense it's natural gas mm. UAE, it's um, oil, and same for Saudi Arabia. You know, these are that they, they and they have small populations, but a huge amount of um, these hydrocarbons that are worth trillions of dollars, right? So you have they've got all of this cash, mm. and um, they, they 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 are able to buy, as we've seen, wh whatever they like and whoever they like often. So it's it's not washing the money. Mm -hmm. It's it's washing in some sense. Uh, there's different needs, and different countries have different needs. It's 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 a reputational element to it as well. There's nothing bigger than global sport. Uh, when you if you want to um, have a platform or a megaphone, um, sport offers you that. Um, it also makes you look more of a benign force. It's not you know. Let's not talk about human rights abuses. Let's talk about all these football players and this tournament we've got. And I think Qatar is actually even more interesting in one sense than the others. Mm. It's got a domestic population of 300,000 at most, um, which is, you know, a town um, in, in, in the UK, um, 
Dublin's probably bigger than that, I would assume, Nicola, right? It is, yeah, um, about 1.3 million, I think. Right, so four yeah. times yeah. four times smaller than Dublin, but it's a country. Um, and it is in a relatively difficult neighbourhood there in the Persian Gulf. Um, and there's some safety in in just being known, mm. not necessarily known in a for them, not necessarily being known in a good way or, or a bad way, just being known as some place that's important. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, do you remember um, the first Gulf War? Mm -hmm. um, there was Saddam Hussein, dictator in Iraq, who decided, you know what, I've had enough of these people next door. I'm just going to pile in um, into Kuwait. And, you know, he did. He managed to do it, and it was the Gulf War, and um, that is quite terrifying if you're a very small place that this can happen to you. Now, K Kuwait, for most people, doesn't really mean anything. Like if I went to a primary school or, or into a pub, Kuwait probably is not going to be somewhere that most people are aware of. Um, and even even at the time, but for the United States, um, you know, and, and having having um, deciding they were going to do something about it, Kuwait could easily have just been swallowed up in that sense by by um, by Iraq. Qatar faced a very similar situation in 2017. The Saudi-led group that included the UAE. Um, Bahrain, Egypt as well. Mm. They decided to launch a air, land and sea blockade of, of Qatar. So there was even talk that Saudi may even invade Qatar. And that there's the US base there, so there's one, one, one reason why they wouldn't might, might have been that. But I think another reason is it's so well known by that point. Hang on. What two years before the World Cup or three years before the World yeah, Cup? Yeah. Surely not. Yeah. Um, they own Paris Saint Germain. They own Neymar. Um, you know, we know these people. Mm. I think there's an element of protection through. Um, They're sort of punching as such. Yeah, yeah, like, and it, and it, it, it was, it was something that was talked about and discussed um, a lot, to be honest. And they're sporting. Um, investments, I think, help them, give them a form of protection. Uh, one form of protection, not the only form of protection, but I think just that is is, is quite quite vital. And if you ask them or, or or the others, they say, well, you know, we have a domestic audience that also likes sports, so why shouldn't we um, invest some of our money? Um, the Saudis and, and the Emiratis as well, they talk about um, obesity uh, crisis and having um, sport and something that is healthy and promotes healthy lifestyles might um, help their their own population to engage in practicing sport. I, I don't really buy that. I don't think, you know, um, buying Cristiano Ronaldo makes you less fat or go for a run. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you, you know, you could see he's fit on TV. You might want to go for a jog through that as well. And, and most people, you um, um, consume sport through the TV, whether it's in your neighborhood or, or thousands of miles away. So on yeah, a couch they, or drinking a beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do most people watch it? Normally yeah. like downing something, be it food or something liquid. Yeah. You know, you're probably you're probably less healthy two hours after the <laughs> the yeah. football match you watched exactly. or, or the cricket match or whatever than, than before it started. But but anyway, yeah, there, there is a... Um, and they talk about yeah. trying to, are hoping to diversify their economies away from those natural resources that they yes. have. Um, so each place is different. Each purchase is different. Each lure that they are, they're trying to make to international sports bodies to come to their territories and to hold these events and all the rest of it. But it seems to me that, well, first of all, that kind of money has to be totally skewing the market. Uh, 100%. 100%. Making everything so bloody expensive. I mean, who can compete? That's like trying to compete with drug money. Um, yeah. You just can't do it. So you can't. One hundred percent. There's that, and then there's. I mean, there's the idea that has sport 
in itself been so completely corrupted by that money that nobody has an ability to say no, that there's never enough. That sort of sense of that greed that's there to make more and more money. I understand it's a business. I understand that there's, you know, shareholders and people that own things and they want to make money. But it seems to me that there's no sport left that's sort of got a moral compass anymore. No, and that they're, they're not kind of regulated. There's nothing on top of the, the 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 people that are supposed to look after sport to make sure they are as well. So mm. and in terms of does it skew So people who are there to regulate are being paid. So they're not like a kind of a voluntary organization at the very top of any of these sports. Is that no, and yeah. no, no. And and look, um, there's like you can unpack this in a couple of different ways here. So let, let's look at what's happened to 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 you talked about the marketplace and I was talking about um, the cost of buying and selling football players. Mm. Most clubs aren't lucky to have a wealthy sugar daddy, right? Someone who can sustain uh, a loss, maybe, maybe a few. Teams like Barcelona, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich as well, these big teams in, in football, they're also not allowed to be owned or at least not wholly owned in the case of Bayern Munich. The other two, you can't be owned by an entity, an individual or a company. But now, even if you've got a sugar daddy, there is no sugar daddy that can compete with a nation state. <laughs> so you have some of the richest countries on the planet suddenly in a marketplace bidding up the price of, of talent. So what we saw, for example, in 2017, this was, I think this was the moment everyone was like, wow, we're in trouble here. Um, Barcelona had um, this strike force, and for your football fans may know it, and if you don't follow football, imagine the three um, most exciting, gifted players in the world, all in this, in this, in this lineup. They had Lionel Messi, who's very well known, they had um, Neymar, the Brazilian, um, and I think it was Luis Suarez, the Uruguayan guy from from um, who just joined from from Liverpool. There, and a very exciting strike force. Uh, and it, what Barcelona do, and what Spanish clubs do, according to the way their league structured, is that they have each player has to have a buyout clause, so a usually a prohibitively high price mm -hmm. that if someone wants to buy them and if the club doesn't want to sell them, if they meet this, this clause, um, they're free to go. And Neymar, the Brazilian, had a clause of 222 million euros, which at the time was double the amount anyone had ever played, paid for a football player, more than double at the time. And then what happened was Paris Saint-Germain, owned by um qatar sovereign wealth fund uh, sent a couple of lawyers to the offices of the spanish league with a briefcase with a check in it for that amount and bang this guy has left barcelona and has gone to um france and a new um kind of price is set for what football players cost yeah. and then obviously the salaries are inflated and what we've seen since then is clubs trying to compete and trying to keep up um, hemorrhaging huge amounts of cash, putting their own futures in jeopardy. And that is, is, is one example of what this influx of, of cash has done to that marketplace. Um, Nicola, one so other example. It's sort of overheated but, in the same way the, a property boom would. 100%, yeah. And, and the thing is, um, everyone else is at risk of going bust except these countries because they could just you know wait it out it, it's not it's 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 pocket change it's it's something that you might leave uh, as a tip in a restaurant for them mm. uh, but for the rest of the industry it absolutely skews it and their power is immense also over the regulator as well because Qatar not only bought the football team they created a um huge sports television network that owns and broadcasts sports, big big sports, football, Formula One, Olympics, across the Middle East. And they also built channels 
in France, where they own the team, in Spain. Um, and that means they're able to pour even more money mm. into leagues. So in terms of conflict of interest, you've got um, and, 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 and UEFA. So the biggest competition in football is the Champions League. And then in the Champions League, you have a team owned by the Qataris and a broadcaster that's paying them top dollar to, <laughs> to broadcast it. Mm. So when it comes to um, regulating them, you, you're in, are you going to punish someone who's pouring billions into your product? You're probably not. And that's what's happened. They've got away with uh, multiple kind of investigations of breaching um, uh, cost control regulations, for example. And even in the Premier League, this this was a crazy case. Um, and it's the collision of these Middle Eastern powers and, 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 and the league. Saudi Arabia, uh, belatedly, a decade after Qatar and the UAE decided it wants to be a player in sports. We've seen recently. So in 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 2020 2021, it wanted to buy Newcastle United, an English Premier League football team, through its sovereign wealth fund, the PIF. That deal was blocked for a year, and there was there was like oh my, you know, people were thinking finally the Premier League is going to you know, take um, a stand against state actors after, you know, allowed Manchester City to be bought by the United Arab Emirates in 2008. But, you know, now it's going to take a stand because do you remember Jamal Khashoggi? Yes. A journalistic mm-hmm. colleague, you know, he, they, he was murdered horrifically. We, you know, butchered in, 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 the, Sa- in the Saudi embassy in Istanbul. He, he, there isn't a body to bury and that, that, that the United Nations was found was at the hands of the Saudis. So that's why the Premier League is 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 blocking this this Saudi um, arrival in the Premier League. Well, that wasn't the case at all. Mm. That was not the case at all. What what had happened was during this Gulf blockade, the Saudi blockade of of um, Qatar, the the channel, the Saudi sports, uh, the Qatari sports network, I, I described called Bein Sport, mm. was effectively stolen and pirated by Saudi Arabia as part of its campaign against Qatar. And this this, um, rebel channel called Be Out Q, not very subtle, right? Be in sports and and Be Out Q was was broadcast um, around the world to to, to hinder the the, the business of Be in sports. And they were complaining to everyone, to to FIFA, to UEFA, to tennis, to Formula One, and to the Premier League, You've got to take action against these pirates. They're stealing our rights. We pay you billions and they're just stealing it. They're ripping us off and they're ripping you off. Um, and this this just kept going on because none of these none of these leagues and teams and competitions could get legal representation in Saudi Arabia. No, none of these Western law firms who have great business in Saudi mm-hmm. wanted, to, wanted to take the case on. So this thing was meandering. So what happened? was the Qataris put pressure on the Premier League to say, you have to block the deal because they're pirates. And the blockade was still on. And then guess what happens? The Emir of Qatar emerges on um, an airport runway. Um, The steps of his private jet um, come down. He disembarks. He hugs the um, crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. He, they have an embrace and guess what blockade over and guess what else the block on the newcastle takeover suddenly also mysteriously disappears saudi arabia because qatar has cleared the premier league to um, now owns a now owns a, an english football club so what you know let's take a moment there to think about this it's just extraordinary you know a a one sovereign in in the middle east has permitted one of Britain's biggest exports, the Premier League, to sell a club, to allow the sale of a club to go through to another sovereign in the Middle East. And we're just watching this. Yeah. And like, you know, with a property bubble, it will eventually burst. But where is this going with with football? And we'll come on to some of the other sports in a minute. But where is it going? And like... They'll essentially, or could essentially, those countries we're talking about, buy up everything. They could. Um, and um, I think if the will is there, which it seems like there is, they will. 
um, in, 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 we've seen it increasingly. We're going to talk about what happened in, in, in golf in a second. But, you know, you, you look at what they want. Boxing, big boxing fights. Where, where are they? They're in, in Saudi Arabia. That's where the biggest purses are. Um, you know, football players, Cristiano Ronaldo um, is paid this inordinate amount of cash, how many hundreds of millions of dollars, he's 37 years old, but he's also one of the most famous men in the world. What a pitch man for your country. He's he's over there. Uh, Lionel Messi might have said no. I believe it was family reasons. His wife, I don't think, wanted to live in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and that would be an interesting conversation as well. Um, but he's also a pitch man for Saudi Arabia because he's done a deal with the, the tourism authority there. You know, I talked to someone at Real Madrid recently. They told me that Karim Benzema, their centre forward, again, he's, he's in his mid-30s towards the end of his career, but still extremely talented, was, was given the best award in football for individual players last year. That's how good he is. He, he's just gone to, to a team in Saudi Arabia. And they said he, he'd been in, in, in Madrid for, for about a decade. His, his Per year, he will earn more than he earned in a decade over there, they said. So yeah. we couldn't stand in his way. Um, it, it's, 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 it's pulling. It's this gravitational force of, 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 of Saudi money or Gulf money, if you will, pulling sport, um, pulling culture towards them. And like, you know, the likes, say, of boxing, and I suppose into the into that mix walks Daniel Kinahan, you mm. know, the head of a, a, an international drug cartel with money to burn and with contacts in boxing, a sport that maybe, is there a particular culture of it in those Gulf regions or is it new? Do they care what the sport is? They just want any sport, basically, because... Uh, and 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 they'll ignore who's bringing it because that's exactly what really happened in the case of Daniel Kinahan. I mean, that story in itself, you know, the Kinahans are are such a vast sort of a story. Um, you sometimes wonder where to start with them, but take the boxing and and what Daniel Kinahan did in the boxing, and in a very small way in the beginnings of his empire, which started out in Spain. He started doing exactly that, taking on boxers, paying them more money than anybody else could afford to pay them, making losses, sucking up those losses um, and, you know, creating this nirvana for the boxers and creating this whole new thing for the normal people to compete with, which they couldn't. And then he goes to Dubai and uh, gets essentially welcomed there because of what he brings with him, doesn't he? It's not because probably of his drug money that I think he has and remains there. I think it's because of what sport he brought in. Yeah, yeah. And he, you know, the boxers as well, in a small scale in terms of laundering reputations, think about all of those um, boxers that are in his stable all saying positive things about him. Yeah. It rehabilitates his reputation, not Daniel Kinahan, the um, kingpin of a drug cartel, but Daniel Kinahan, who these boxers absolutely idolize and think he's the best thing that's happened to their sport, that suddenly we're, we're not talking about that. And, and on a broader scale, if you want, you know, you think about what the countries want, and that's why you know, sport's useful to them. And it, there is a kind of amorality to everything that's happening here. Mm. Everything is has got a price, um, and, and and you hold your nose and, and you take it. And for me, none of this exists. And it's not you know we're looking at you know Saudi bad, Qatar bad, you know UAE bad, and you know look look what's happened. But all of this is enabled. You can't do it on your own just because you have money. It must mean you need a counterparty mm. who's willing to accept that money, and is willing to execute your plans for you so all of those kids who went through our education systems here in, in Europe or in the states who then went into the sports industry or went into the legal industry or the public relations industry um, all the parts that make modern um, societies work and in this case the sport economy work are all co-opted too and are happy to be co-opted mm. that's 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 part of the story as well um, it's 
it's not just the athletes that are being attracted to this. It's it's pretty much everybody else, all the other parts of this. And, you know, the, the thing that I find, um, you, you learn about, um, I guess, us as people, or humanity more broadly, without getting too heavy in this, in this <laughs> sense, is, 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 is basically, everyone, what's the line? What's too much? This has shown nothing is too much if, if the price is right. So, you know, for example, we're here, you know, I'm talking to you from London and um, this city makes huge amounts of money from, from um, laundering the reputations and, and fixing the legal problems or banking the money of, of, of regimes or of, of um, questionable individuals uh, without, without a problem. But then, you know, at a dinner party on Friday, you know, or Saturday, it's, oh, did you see that awful thing that happened to that journalist? Yeah, he was hacked up in, 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 the, in the Saudi um, embassy in Istanbul. But, you know, back to work on Monday, who's doing the work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, from a wider point of view, it's a bit like, I suppose, the cocaine problem. It's the demand, actually, that keeps the supply coming. So, you know, from sports fans paying uh, pay-per-view to watch these they know I suppose what's going on in the background and you know everybody I suppose who puts their hand in their pocket buys a ticket or a t-shirt or anything we're, we're all actually funding it blindly it, it, it's yeah. like climate change we're blindly you know uh, making these problems worse and worse and worse and yet not making that connect or we have that ability as human beings to disconnect completely and that's what sport offers you doesn't it yeah. So you know, can't I just watch the game? Yeah. And that's what that's what most people want. You know, the the, the escapism is a bit, and that that that's the other thing, I guess. Um, the thrill uh, and the high. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's that, human nature, isn't it? We it's probably right deep down in our DNA that we just, no matter what, need that. So yeah, that, that people are buying. How the hell did golf get dirtied by all this? I was listening to you on the radio here in Ireland recently talking about this. The PGA. Now, again, a sport I wouldn't know a huge amount about. Have tricked around with it a little bit, uh, but I wouldn't be somebody now who would uh, who would sit and watch that game. But I know I'm few and far between. It's just so popular. Um, the PGA has sold its soul. Mm. It has, and it's kind of a crazy, remarkable story, but a very simple answer in the end as well, because those dollar bills just stacked up to a level that that meant they folded. And but the story to get there is is fascinating. Um, so the Saudis, and again, it's all through this one um, sovereign wealth fund, the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, um, that that this has happened and all within the space of a year. In fact, I'd never been to a golf event before, but I covered my first golf tournament um, almost exactly a year ago in, in, in June 2022. And it was the opening of this, this tournament called Live Golf, the Saudi funded rival to, you know, the fusty decades old PGA and the European tour, all the, all the, um, the, 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 that cloistered golf world that we knew suddenly torn asunder by by this by this pretender, and I went I went to to see what all the fuss was about, and it, it's kind of a remarkable thing that's happened here. Um, the the amount of money the Saudis put on the table to entice um, and break golf is 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 in the billions. Individual golfers, um, for example. Here's some who accepted it. Phil Mickelson, mm. um, famous US golfer, and I think for, for golf fans, he doesn't need an introduction, but one of the best ever players of the game, uh, took almost um, if reportedly $200 million just as a signing on fee. That's more than you'd earn in a, in a career uh, as, a, as a golfer. You know, and then you've got pots of 100 million, tens of millions, and, and you know, even for like journeymen, life-changing amounts of money mm. and, and then on the other hand you had this resistance initially from the pga um that organization that ran golf and you had the likes of rory mcelroy and tiger wood staying loyal to this organization as it as as it fought against this um usurper 
And what we'd seen over the, the past year was a very, very kind of nasty public battle, be it for perception and also a legal battle um, in Europe and the United States against um, these organizations, but with the, with the Saudi-backed group accusing um, the PGA in the States of um, antitrust violations, monopolistic behavior, et cetera, and, and the, the PGA um, kicking those, those rebels who joined out of its tournament. So, it, And then on an individual basis, um, players who attended each other's weddings, uh, close friends, uh, falling out very publicly. We had um, the site of golfers talking up Saudi Arabia's human rights record um, very quickly as soon as as soon as they'd um, accepted that money. It, it's just a very, very um, quite nasty situation uh, on on all levels. And one of the things that I found particularly galling was the PGA and its uh, commissioner Jay Monahan. Um, invoked the 9-11 attacks and, and the families of the victims of 9-11, the more than 2,000 people who perished when, when those planes hit um, the World Trade Center buildings in 2001 to say, you know, um, there's never been a golfer who's played on the PGA Tour who's had to apologize for being on the PGA Tour, essentially saying, you know, these guys are playing with an organization that, and a country that is linked to, you know, the worst mm. um, terror attack in the United States. That's how kind of nasty things go. And then all of a sudden, after all of that, after using Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods to repel this, this organization, calling it grotesque and all, all the rest of it, and the, the legal action, we suddenly get this stunning announcement that there's going to be a merger between Live Golf, the Saudi funded organization and the European and American tour. So the PGA and the DP World Tour. And suddenly we're 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 all business partners again. So the same guy who Jay Monahan, who was was invoking 9-11 and all the rest of it, is going to be the chief executive of this organization. And and the chairman is going to be the governor of of, of the Pro public investment fund of Saudi Arabia, the sovereign wealth fund. It, it took it was a stunning thing. And essentially, for me, when I when you look at the terms of this, Saudi Arabia get, and the PIF gets first refusal on any new money in golf. That, to me, looks like and sounds like Saudi Arabia has bought professional golf, oh, sure. which is stunning. So was it the structure of golf that became the problem? Did Monaghan sit atop and have a decision-making power, which was too much for one individual? It, it 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 seems it seems that way because very few people knew. Like you know, four or five people quietly decided the future of golf. Whereas you know, this sport is built on the backs of all of these players, and, and you know, wheeling out. I feel particularly for for Rory McIlroy. Uh, he he's been so um, uh, publicly fluent as well in his opposition to this and the reasons why, and he's come across as a real um, statesman. He's been put in an inv invidious position here. One, he turned down hundreds of millions of dollars to not go. Um, so he looks, in, in the eyes of some, a little bit foolish. And the other, he he kind of is left with no option. Yeah. Because he wants to carry on. If he wants to carry on playing golf, this is the train that's left the station. Um, and, and he had no part in the, the, the kind of decision-making process. We still don't know what it's all going to look look like. The, the new company that's going to be on top of um, golf now, the, the for-profit company, hasn't even got a name yet. We don't know what it means materially in terms of golf tournaments. We don't know wh whether Live Golf, that, that rebel tour that kicked all this off, will actually continue to exist in, in the form it does. Like There is a lot to be ironed out. But all we know, I think, is Saudi Arabia has essentially got... A, a seat at the table and a seat that could become bigger and bigger, multiplying to more seats as it as it's as it's able to plow more money into this. Um, as for the families of those victims of 9-11 who were used, um, they're, they're you know quite rightly um furious about this. As are US senators. There was a there was a senator from Connecticut who said, you know, I had 
the the people from the PGA in my office the week before this was announced, um, calling these people all, all the names under the sun, and then suddenly they 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 they're, they're business partners and they're putting out very positive press releases and making very positive public comments about this. Um, you know, it, it is stunning. But one of the one of the reasons why this might have happened is. The PGA, on the one hand, is a golf tour, golf uh, organization. Yes, it's got millions of dollars coming through um, its its balance sheet through sponsorships and TV contracts, but those are dwarfed by the power that Saudi wealth could bring to bear. Right? Eventually, those legal costs and just just trying to take these people on, it can't beat them when it comes to money. Um, so, perhaps a degree of pragmatism eventually and then there is this legal issue from the Saudi point of view and this was I think really interesting one of the things that really interested me when when the public investment fund was eventually cleared to buy Newcastle in the Premier League the Premier League put out a statement to say that the there is a separation between the public investment fund the PIF that owned Newcastle they were given legally binding assurances about that and the Saudi state so this is not a state um, uh, buyout, which, again, you kind of have to turn your brain off because the proof's in the name. It's the sovereign wealth fund um, of, of Saudi Arabia that owns Newcastle. But yeah, sure. And then while the litigation in the States is going on, the, <laughs> the PIF and the Saudis fought the other way. So hang on. Um, in America, you have disclosure and you can um, have the internal emails of um, the, the public investment fund um, produced in, 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 in these civil cases. And you can have individuals who lead these organizations deposed. So that risked the deposition of Yasser al-Rumayyan, the governor of the PIF. So he could have been interviewed under oath over all of this. Mm -hmm. And they tried to prevent that by saying, oh, no, 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 you can't because we have sovereign immunity. And you, you're like, hang on. In England, you said you're not a sovereign state and you're, you're, you're um, a private investment fund. But in America, you're, you're requesting this sovereign immunity to say, no, we're part of a state. So that, again, mm -hmm. tells you all things to all people. Um, and they are bending the world to their will. So now we've had this deal, no deposition, um, and, and um, the, that, that case is gone. Uh, however, I don't think it's the end of it. Um, the US Senate uh, has convened a committee that might um, call these people uh, to testify in front of them, to ask difficult questions. And, and there may be an ongoing antitrust case in the US that might might cause this deal some problems. Yeah, sounds like a sort of a, you know, a, a small thing that might happen in, in the same way, a little bit like how it felt uh, with some of the, the the boxing cases that were taken through the uh, the US courts when when you know these small little areas of clarity were going to come up and perhaps Daniel Kinnan was going to have to go and give evidence in a court case and you know in the end of the day somebody with enough wealth and enough lawyers can keep battling that couldn't they and keep fighting that along and it could go on for years and yeah if you've enough can I ask you can I ask you a question Nicola you yeah. you follow this a bit closer than I have um We've had we've seen the U.S. name Daniel Kinahan and a number of his associates um, and designate them as, as as essentially wanted people. There's a bounty on his head. Mm. We we kind of know where he is, right? He's in the United Arab Emirates. Yeah. What what why is he still there? Why has he not been um, um, sent to face justice? Isn't that the big question? Um, so to answer it simply, I don't know. Um, mm. From somewhat informed speculation, I would say that Daniel Kinahan has some protection from uh, certainly very powerful friends he has in the United Arab Emirates. I do think he will be sent back. I think he'll be sent here uh, to be put before the courts. But I think that they don't like being told what to do in the Emirates. Um, they'll do it when they're well and ready to do it. He definitely has powerful friends. I don't think that's going to protect him forever. And I don't think himself, his father or his brother are going to be the only people in the history of humanity 
to uh, walk away from when their heads are on wanted posters in the US. But it just seems to me that they've been able to buy some extra time, uh, more so than others. The cases are a little bit complex. Uh, in the case of uh, one of their business partners, uh, Ridwan Taghi, he was in the Emirates under an assumed identity. And I think when they discovered him there, they were quite happy to throw him out because he wasn't playing by their rules. But Daniel Kinahan has been there very openly as himself. He had no convictions up until then. He was allowed bed in for a long, long time and bring all that money and all what you're talking about, really. He's brought boxing out there, hasn't he? He's been the one that has brought it out there. And that has to buy him something from the yeah, United absolutely. Arab Emirates and from the, you know, a, a, and further into the Gulf as well. Um Saudi Arabia too, right? Yeah, exactly. So he is a he he's not just your regular drug dealer, is he? Because of that sort of boxing wing element that he he had and brought and all those powerful people. I mean, we were looking at him meeting with wasn't it the Pakistani sports minister mm. posing for photographs with him. I mean, that's a pretty serious individual to be a guy from Oliver Bond Flats to be finding himself standing beside and, you know, shaking hands with. So it's complex. He's 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 got a lot of power out there, but I think they will just throw him out because there is a, a, a sort of a belief here, certainly amongst law enforcement, that in the end of the day, he's going to be sent home and his money's going to stay. <laughs> and, right. and really, that'll be, you know, uh, They'll, they'll they'll be they'll be finished with them, and are they yeah. going to hand back his money to the US? Are they going to hand his money back anywhere? No, it's probably going to be going into that big pot that you're talking about. That's buying up the footballers and any other bit of sport they want. Now we also know the Gulf are into Formula One and horse racing, certainly. But where do you see the tentacles going next into what sport? I mean, the likes of what have we left? What about tennis? Yeah, well, um, they already have. They pay huge amounts for these exhibition tennis matches. Um, uh, some players have said no. Uh, speaking to um, Andy Murray's agent um, a year or two ago, and he said he turned down uh, a big number to play over there because he just didn't feel it was right to do that under the circumstances, particularly the human rights record. Mm. And, you know, someone like... Th that's the other thing. We're not talking about people who are desperately poor yeah. uh, we're talking about already wealthy sports people who they're attracting not not um you know the, the other the other migrant workers if you would um have no choice we're talking about the nepali laborers the filipino domestic staff the the ghanaian taxi drivers the kenyan security guards where they're coming from it's it's like so i can feed my family the basic um meals to, to sustain them and to put a roof on the head to send my child to school and some of that i guess is understandable um they they, they can't almost um think beyond the basic needs of survival and mm -hmm. this is what these countries offer them and take advantage of as well in terms of some of the treatment but for elite athletes you know you have a choice and in the case of andy murray he did but to answer your question um for sure for sure, the Qataris want to host the Olympic Games. Um, it's something they wanted even before the World Cup. They were frustrated when the International Olympic Committee um, rejected their, their their efforts to move the the games to October. You know, they're normally held in July and August mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's unbearably hot in in Qatar in the summer. It's dangerously hot, mm. um, which which makes you wonder why that FIFA committee all those years ago in 2010, December the 2nd, in the snow of Zurich, said it was the right place to host the Football World Cup in that very period. Um, the tournament had to be moved after their, their crazy vote mm. to um, November and December in, in a way so people didn't die, um, either the fans or, or players playing, even though these, these stadiums were were air conditioned in the end you, you can't air condition an entire country as <laughs> someone famously uh, once said um and then for the saudis they are absolutely laser focused on um bringing the world cup back to the world uh, back to the gulf right. the soccer world cup um either in 2030 or 2034 and to do that they have been traversing the world 
signing accords with various nations. The way the way the World Cup is picked, um, Nicola, is the FIFA's members, 211 of them, get in a room and essentially stick their hand up for the one they like now, mm-hmm. and not those 24 men. And so you're seeing deals with Mauritania, bilateral deals with Mauritania, Somalia, uh, with the, uh, the the CAF, the the, the organisation that runs African football, um, various countries. So you know when it when it comes to um, casting votes, you remember, hang on, who sorted you out? Um, so they're who, actively who, lobbying, sort of actively lobbying, act, actively put, pouring their resources into them. Mm, bloody hell! I mean, the kind of money you've been talking about, and uh, maybe we'll finish up on this. I could listen to you all day, I have to say, and I'm not a mad sports fan, but I'm finding this incredibly interesting. But the sort of money you're talking about here uh, and that's been washing around football, that's, you know, boxing is only a little tiny pinprick in in this thing, but, you know, golf and all the rest of it. Like, sport is a percentage of the world economy now, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's... it's... Uh, it, it's tiny, but but it... but no, noticeable. Right. Notice as a form of entertainment, we're in we're in we're in the hundreds of billions, probably. With if you add all of the kind of accoutrements that involved, you know, um, because it is a travel business, it is a broadcast business. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the, the player trading, the companies involved. Yeah, it's it's a sizable uh, industry, but. Um, in comparison to the uh, world of oil and gas, which these people derive almost all of their income from at the moment, um, yes, they're planning their post post oil future and diversifying the economy. It is it is but a fraction, and once they bring um, their their resources to bear on sport, they 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 can't be competed with. It's it's a road to ruin. Mm-hmm. If anyone tried to match them dollar to dollar in in a competition, you know they they if they wanted to, and we've seen, uh, are able to buy whatever they like when it comes to sports so far. So they're um, only really going to sort of outbid one another in this crazy money, like. But essentially, yes, and then and then then you get into the politics of it. You know, then you'd start trading with each other. Um, about you know golf politics, um, you know in the in a room of, uh, in a palace somewhere in the Gulf, maybe a few of the um, emirs and the sheikhs and the kings and princes will get together and divvy out who does what, um, and um, you know we'll we'll get to find out. I'm, I'm not sure that is what international sport was designed to be like. No, but that economy of international sport and whatever percentage of the world economy it is must be growing since you talked about really, I suppose that pivot point is around 2017. So in the last sort of, what is it, eight to 10 years, the worth, the overall value, if you could get a figure on it, of sport must be increasing so much. Yeah, massively. Look, for example, here's a good one to to kind of finish on, I suppose. The, the, um, Manchester United, the football team, is 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 on the market now, and because there are potential investors from the Gulf, I guess the the price or a tag for this football team is is, and there's no guarantee it's going to be profitable. By the way, year in year out, um, <laughs> because of because of um, the the spending on wages and, and and players we talked about earlier, we're, we're talking to you know. They're they're seeking six billion, which is crazy. The balance sheet wouldn't suggest it's worth anywhere near six billion. But because there are people in the marketplace, um, not just these guys. To be fair, um, we have um, we have um, private equity companies in America as well. A few but Russians in there as well, isn't there? A few Russians, in there. yeah, and they, 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 well, not anymore. But yeah. yes, we we, yeah. we 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 did um, have have Russians in there. Um, that the, the numbers are just just telephone numbers now, just yeah. zero 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 zero. You know, you know, where does it end? It, this this is this is, and if you're competing with a with a nation state, um, that. Where money is no object, that that's where it ends. In fact, actually, the thing I'd want to end on, Nicola, is this: yeah. um, the, we had a situation here. You, you've just reminded me by talking about oligarchs, actually, where we allowed a known ally um, of Vladimir Putin to come to London to set up his life, to bring his billions, and buy a Premier League football club. 
in Chelsea, Roman Abramovich in yeah. Chelsea. He he poured money into this team that, you know, was was average, was okay. It was not one of the world's biggest teams when he comes in. Pours his money in, he gets all of this 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 um, popularity and fame, and um, and you know the Chelsea fans can't get enough of him. He builds this 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 team in West London, and suddenly his friend invades his neighbouring country, Ukraine. And then we decide this guy that we rolled out the red carpet for, that we knew is the friend of Vladimir Putin, um, he must be sanctioned. He should go. Um, and it puts his team in a spiral, doesn't it? So he's got to get out fast. This football team that millions of people like, this cultural institution in West London, it's not just any old company. It's a team that people live for and that's what that passion of sport again and it suddenly puts all of that at risk uh you have to ask why did you let these people buy these things in the first place mm. now what if tomorrow saudi arabia isn't the ally but it becomes a a, a pariah state that the, the 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 winds of um diplomacy and politics suddenly change and they're no longer our ally we, they own Newcastle United, though, don't they? Or Qatar could own Manchester United, another big cultural asset. Are we? Is this not something that someone should be looking after or, or wondering about? Because um, that is the risk at the moment. You have teams and play, sorry, fans online cheerleading for um, the next autocratic regime to buy their football club because they want to win the Champions League or they want to buy their centre forward. They are, there's an army of people advocating for these regimes online or, or you know, in the pub to buy their football club because they're rich. And that is where the value of sport is today. Mm. Tragic, Tariq, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Tragic. Well, that's, that's where we are. Yeah, and look, keep doing all that fantastic work you're doing because uh, it's so important that at least we can talk about it we know about it you know is it ever going to make a change probably not but we are aware we're not blindly uh, you know imagining that it is uh, that sport is anything other than what it has become which is a, a twisted economy in itself yeah it'll be interesting if we if we have this conversation again in, in five or ten years to see uh, you know whether the wind has continued to blow in that direction or yeah. whether some guardrails have been put in place. Um, be are, to... are how many more of my guys are going to be involved? You know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess it, keep, it keeps us in work, Nicola. It, it does, <laughs> in, in an honest living. So listen, <laughs> thank you, Tariq Panja. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Brilliant.